Hello and welcome to Kiev Sports. I am Amutu Gajaga and thank you for joining us. Coming up tonight, African football is never short of talking point. But this time, the big talking point is about a sham action or sham activity which we are talking about. That is the COVID-19. Is it being used as a weapon to gain or to lose points in football? It's Sierra Leone versus Benin again. The big controversy. We'll also be talking about the Gambia Scorpions who were in Turkey and Talia to be precise for two weeks, a training camp. Was it a successful one? They had three friendly international matches within the period and we will also look at that. All that on tonight's Cube Sports. <music> Welcome and thank you if you're just joining us. This is Q Sports and I'm Amadou Kajaga. Well, the decisive Africa Cup of Nations qualifier between Sierra Leone and Benin, which has been resettled. Um, this is the second time it's been resettled. And Monday, it was meant to be played in Guinea at the General Lansana Conte Stadium. Just a few minutes before the players taken to the pitch, while they're warming up. Something happened. The CAF officials came with the test result of the Sierra Leone players, six of them infected with COVID-19, allegedly, because that's the word that we have to use here. So we will have to digest this and see if COVID-19 is being used as a weapon. And the game couldn't go ahead. Now we settled again for today, Tuesday. At the time of this broadcast, of course, uh, we wouldn't know if the match would actually go on or not. But... Um, Big story, Ari Darame, my guest on this show today. Uh, huge story, uh, Mr. Gajaka, um, as you rightly say. Um, all the other countries that have qualified for AFCON uh, have even forgotten th about the fact that they've qualified and they're busy playing friendlies. Some of them have had four, five, six friendlies in the interim, and we still have these two teams fighting for that one remaining place. And it has gone from farce to farce. Uh, you know, the first one was, of course, in Sierra Leone, where, first of all, people had objected to the pitch, and which, to be honest, was terrible anyway. Uh, but the Benin players thought they had no choice but to go there and play. And then, of course, several of their team tested positive, and they refused to play the match. And so it has spiraled into where we are now. The rules say um, refusal to play should have seen them forfeit the match. But, of course, this is Africa, and our rules are just there on paper, as in everything, uh, they never enforced. If they were enforced, Benin would have been kicked out and Sierra Leone would have gone through. There is this saying in the regulations that the COVID test results should be out at least two hours before kickoff. How on earth did we get to a point where it is only a few minutes before the match that the results are out? Uh, not just a few minutes, five minutes before the match. <laughs> um, and as we say, I mean, sometimes we, 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 we laugh and we joke about these things, but these things are quite serious because we're talking about football on an international scale. We're not talking about a league match. We're talking about qualification for the AFCON. It's the biggest tournament in African football. And you would think that competition more than any, and because of what had happened in Freetown already, that they would make sure there were no problems and that the match would proceed. And that's two hours before we would have gotten their results, both teams. And then that could have been it, what, five minutes before kickoff? It's ridiculous. Is COVID-19 being used as the weapon for, for certain teams? Because we wouldn't get to know the details of all of this. Are they real COVID results or are they, you know, faked ones? Is, is it this being meant to punish a particular team? or to gain an unfair advantage or also. These, these things are questions that everyone keeps asking. It's a difficult one, and I say it's a difficult one because it then calls into question the integrity of the medical people, the scientists who do the testing. Are we saying that they are colluding with their national football associations to actually punish teams? Because if, if we, that's what we're saying effectively, um, that you're, you're asking, you know, highly respected doctors, nurses, and, and these sorts of people to actually collude and, and come up with fake results. Having said that- And that would that, be a disaster if it, that's uh, where meant to be the because case. Because where, where does it go from then? And, and the reason I say this is because you and I, we followed African football long enough to know that in the past, some of these medical people have colluded to actually falsify the ages of players. You know, they've known all along that certain players were underage and, and then they've kind of changed it to make them younger or older, or whatever the case may be. So this time, of course, because of that history, 
people are looking at it and, and unfortunately they're all tainted with the same brush that maybe they are colluding, which would be really, really serious. Let's talk about the referee here. That's the Confederation of African Football. They have a disciplinary body. Of course, mm. they have a complaints committee and all of that. Um, after the first incident in Freetown, this is the second time this thing is happening. Sure. It's a never-ending game. Well, uh, in fact, that's what I was going to call it, the kind of never-ending game or the game that never ends up getting played. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if something else crops up today, you know, uh, when the match is 15th of, of uh, uh, June, when it's meant to be rescheduled and somebody objects to something. And then FIFA said, you know what, we're going to tell you, we're going to toss a coin and whoever wins gets awarded a 2-0 victory. Because I think uh, CAF, FIFA, world football, uh, African football particularly, they're getting fed up of it. You know, they need to finalize these teams and they need this match to be played and to be finished with. And it's, it's not getting anywhere close to being that. And just a point on that, if a particular team forfeits their point to the other, whether it's a Benin or a Sierra Leone, the other can still go to the Code of Arbitration for Sport if it gets torn you know, whatever, in, the, in their favour, then we have another controversy again, this back and forth. And this is what CAF don't want. They want it to be settled on the pitch. On the pitch. Having said that, even that is not as simple because if, for example, um, they, uh, it gets settled on the pitch and before the match, six or eight players get their results, as in Sierra Leone, two of the ones who tested positive, I, in quotes, were two of the goalkeepers. And so obviously that's quite serious uh, for a team to be and having to rely on their third choice goalkeeper. goalkeeper. Um, in those circumstances, should that happen again, you can bet that they would object. And the same for Benin. If Benin now had some of their people return positive tests and then they were forced to play the game, they will object. And this is what CAF uh, is trying to avoid. They want both teams to abide by the rules, accept the results, of the medical tests and accept the result on the pitch and let it end there. But honestly, something tells me, because of what has happened already, we have not seen or heard the last of this, no matter what happens. This is also another bad publicity for African football. We, we've been in these kinds of situations. We see so many stupid things happening. Sure. Yes, COVID is not only affecting Africa, but global. Mm. It's a global phenomenon. It's mm. a global problem. We've seen European matches go smoothly. Yeah. If a particular player tests positive, so that's be it, and the player is excused out of the squad. Um, why can't we have a set of standards that everyone follows? Well, well, this is it. There should be uh, international standards, you know, just as there are international standards about the size of a pitch, the size of a goalpost. Um, it should be no different uh, for this sort of thing. Um, if one uh, player tested positive, because uh, and or is injured, for example, as happened with Dean Henderson in the uh, England team, uh, the goalkeeper he's out, and he's the England have been allowed to bring in a, a third uh, choice goalkeeper, um, but that third choice goalkeeper because of COVID rules, has to self-isolate for a certain number of hours, be tested before he actually can join the squad. It's the same. And, you know, these are international rules that should apply across the board. Regardless, Africa should not be asking for special favours or bending the rules. Um, the rules should apply to all. And when it comes to decision-making at the topmost body of African football calf at the disciplinary level, um, should there be some measures put in place to either avoid this, but if in case if it, need, it happens, mm. they can put out a, cross, a certain disciplinary procedure where we wouldn't be in these kinds of situations because sometimes it appears childish. Uh, you know, uh, I think you mentioned you in, in another context in this discussion, you asked, you know, are people hiding behind COVID? I think COVID has completely, has been, you know, no pun intended, a game changer. Um, what it has brought is that it has given people a reason and an excuse to kind of hide behind or use it or, or abuse it, actually. And so they can put in all the strictures they need. But, you know, if they'd done this two years ago, for example, nobody would have legislated for COVID and the impact that COVID has had. So it's forced us now to think the unthinkable and think, OK, COVID has shown us that the unthinkable can and has happened. What if the unthinkable happens again? Do we need to have rules in place, strict disciplinary rules where we say this are the rule, these are the rules and this is because, as I said earlier, um, Benin should have forfeited the match and that should have been the end of it. I mean, they can take it to a court of arbitration. But if the rules had said that, which they do say, but CAF did not stick to their own rules. Uh, and so now we have this mess that we're now in, you know, because Sierra Leone quoted chapter and verse 
from the rules, saying if a team refuses, although it says if they uh, refuse to play unreasonably, you know, if they give an unreasonable, of course, Benin would say, you know, not playing because we did not test, uh, you know, believe in the test results. Most people, fair-minded people, even fair-minded Sierra Leoneans will say, okay, yeah, actually that's, that's a good enough reason to object. Um, but if it was an unreasonable objection, then they, they should have forfeit the match. And for Sierra Leone, a bit of disadvantage here. The match was meant to be played at the home ground, Siaka Stevens Stadium, but because of the pitch, they had to move the game to Guinea. And that brings in a lot of sentiments even about this COVID thing. I've followed <laughs> Sierra Leoneans talking about huge football fans there, about yeah. their national team, that uh, is this it's some sort of thing. Pitch. Guineans <laughs> may be <laughs> trying to play some, some football politics here. But uh, uh, Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea, we have this kind of love-hate relationship. Yeah. Um, our nearest neighbor, we have them on one side, Liberia on the other. And what you have with this particular one is that um, even to the extent where Sierra Leone asked if um, you know, a certain number of spectators could be allowed. Uh, of course, CAF has said it now has to be played behind closed doors. So there's no advantage to anybody. But had it been open to spectators, there are almost half a million Sierra Leoneans living in Guinea. And, and that's not even counting the ones who are the children of Sierra Leoneans born there, born there. who support Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone would have had, it would have been like playing a home match. But as it turns out now, um, they don't have that advantage, but you're right. Um, and I was quite disappointed with some of the journalists I saw discussing this on Sierra Leone TV, where they were saying that um, these are um, uh, Francophone countries, Gabon and Guinea Conakry, ganging up on Sierra Leone, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to disadvantage them and that these are fake results. Yes, they might be Francophone countries, but actually, um, apart from times when there's tension between Guinea and Sierra Leone, relationships between the two are quite good. Exactly. Uh, looking forward to match, if it gets on, to hold on onto the pitch, um, which side are we looking at this? A back and forth, back and forth, but if the players get onto the pitch finally, it's, it's something else. Uh, my Sierra Leone and friends won't like me for this, but uh, looking at the two teams, I think actually Benin are the better side. Um, but uh, football can be crazy. You have instances where somebody can just flip and, and you know, throw the odds out of the window team that's not expected to win ends up winning and we, we could be uh, in that situation here. Um, Sierra Leone don't have the home advantage which they would have had had it been played in Freetown. Um, uh, it's, it's on a neutral ground, no spectators. Um, if you were a footballing person you would say oh Benin but th I think the passions that have been generated from this game uh, will actually see both teams playing way above what we expect them to and of course Sierra Leone have to win. Uh, Benin, of course, can't go into the match thinking, oh, we're going to play for a draw. You and I know if you do that in sport, that is fatal. You end up losing and then, you know, you can't then get back into the groove or the mentality of going for the win. So both teams have to go for a win. And because of that, it's anybody's guess what will happen. Um, but, you know, both teams uh, are angry and that, I suspect, will come into the match. I would not be surprised to see a red card or two in this game. In this game. Well, that is if, if, if it goes on. If I'm it looking on. forward to how uh, things are going to pan out. Um, and between the team, two teams, of course, like you mentioned, uh, Benin being the better side. That is on paper, but on the pitch, um, Sierra yeah. Leone could be inspired by the fall draw that they had against Nigeria. I mean, most teams would be inspired by that. Um, to be 4 nil down, um, counted out, um, some people even leaving the stadium uh, because they thought it was all over. Uh, you know, Nigeria, a really strong squad um, and could have gone and been six nil ahead. And then to come and, and, and turn it around and draw four four, yes, that should be the inspiration. And you're right, to me, if I was the coach, John Kista, that's what I would be playing, that video for them, saying, look guys, you've defied the odds once again, defy the odds again, go out there and do it. And hopefully they will do it, yeah. On that note, we are going to take a short break, but when we come back, it's the Gambia's training camp in Torquay, Antalya, where they spent two weeks, played three international friendly matches, won two, and lost one of them to Kosovo. And we'll talk about that in detail as to how good was the international friendly matches they played and some of the tactics that the coach used and how is it going to help him when he finally does his final selection for the Africa Cup of Nations in Cameroon.
From an early age, we value the feeling of speed, the thrill of the wind as we rush to our destinations, the feel of our feet bounding over the ground, the way the world blurs as we rush by, faster, faster than a ray of light I'm flying. I have one speed, I have one gear. Keep on moving, I won't stop till I get there. Want to experience speed? Then subscribe to the Gambia's 4G LTE mobile network, QCell. With speeds of up to 45 megabytes per second, you can get online in the blink of an eye. The fastest browsing, stream videos faster, do much more faster. Just our star 335 hash to join the fastest club. QCell's 4G LTE mobile network, go faster. For more information, call 111 QCell. Senior boss, we innovate, others follow. Welcome back and thank you very much if you're just joining us. This is Q Sports and I'm Umudu Kajaga. My guest today is Ade Tarane. On this second half of the program, we're going to talk about the Scorpions of the Gambia. They were in Turkey for two weeks, sure. played three international friendly matches. First, it was against Niger, where they, you know, <laughs> of course, won yeah. against Niger two goals to nil. Yeah. You know, good game, fantastic yeah. performances by the players sure. and then second game they played against Togo much fancied side they won one nil sure. their third game against Kosovo they lost by a goal to nil sure. better second half performance but the first half was right, sure. a little bit awful um, Mr. Darame playing international friendly it's how important is it for a team especially like the Gambia qualifying for their made in Africa Cup of Nations and preparing sure. for the Afghan in Cameroon. Uh, as you rightly say, um, for a team that is qualified for its maiden competition of this stature, uh, very important. These games are very important. And what I liked about uh, Sanfia's uh, selection of opponents, he chose teams that are all ranked higher than the Gambia. Um, he could have chosen the easy option uh, and um, chosen teams that are ranked below the Gambia and maybe won those, but they would have shown you nothing. What you want is to test yourself against opponents who, at least on paper, are supposedly better than yourselves. And, and of course, the Kosovo game was historic. It was the first time at senior level that the Gambia had faced a European team. Um, and so that was kind of history in the making, uh, really. So um, it was good. But yes, I th thought it was a success because it gives you a chance to. And of course, we had young Gomez, uh, you know, <laughs> scoring his uh, first uh, international goal. Yeah. You know, so um, uh, I think uh, if I had to give sort of marks out of 10 or 100, I'd give 80 or 85. And I, I say this because, again, I go back to the fact that uh, they were against uh, higher ranked opponents. And uh, they did well. It gave him a chance to kind of play around with his tactics a bit, experiment. And that's what these games really should be about. And the biggest experiment came in the second game that he played that was <laughs> obviously against Togo, Togo, where he started up, you know, nine players who, who on a regular normal um, team competition or maybe in a qualifier or so he wouldn't have started uh, some of those players and tested and them especially the new ones especially the new ones and and uh, you know when i saw it I, I thought brave man and he got quite a bit of criticism for it before the match um but you know you and i know that in football this sort of thing the results end up speaking loudest and the fact that it was another victory uh, meant that you know it was justified and as I said um, in, in, in the previous answer to the question um, you use these matches to experiment uh, players who you said if that was a crucial deciding match he would not have played those players but at some point he has to test them are they up to the mark you know if somebody is injured uh, and I can't rely on that person who is a regular and so on are there people I can call on and that's what he did with those huge, you know, those nine uh, changes. And, you know, in the end, it, it paid off. If there is one player who impressed you in this international friendly, well, there's, of <laughs> course, a first time, Ibrahim Adab, who plays for sure. uh, Sroma, <laughs> and, you know, much loved by that's so right. many Gambians, I mean, even yes. though he's playing for the Scorpions for the first time in these um, three international friendlies. I, I, I think Dabo, um, you know, we read, you and I, that Jose Mourinho has taken over at Roma and wants to keep him there. Um, he has no interest in sending him out on loan because he rates him so highly. And I think that speaks volumes. You know, if a coach like Mourinho says, this chap is going nowhere, then that speaks volumes. And, and I think, you know, um, uh, making your debut, uh, these are the kind of players that the Gambia needs to have. And when you think about it, um, 
for Sierra Leone, for example, we were talking about Sierra Leone Benin in, in, uh, earlier on. Um, uh, we're talking about a Serie A player and one of the big teams at Serie A. I mean, he should go into the next season full of confidence that somebody like Mourinho has a lot of confidence and that should benefit the Scorpions enormously. And so, um, highly impressed. And as I said, Gomez, you know, got um, the, the, the headed goal. Um, that again would have done, and you, you know, in football, it can be the making of you. You know, you play in a match like that, you score your first goal, and then you think, you know what, I can do this. You know, I'm not, um, because sometimes when you bring players newly into a team, they feel out of place and there's a kind of doubt, self-doubt, you know, do I deserve to be here? These guys are the ones who've been there, they've qualified and so on. Uh, have I got a right to be amongst right them? Right to be amongst them. And then you score <laughs> and you think, well, actually, yes, <laughs> I do. So, you know, again, I go back to uh, uh, Coach Sanfier's uh, um, selections and, and I think it was a good thing to bring in, you know, fresh blood, new blood and just to see, you know, can they do it? Can they handle it? And, and they did. He got much criticism from fans and Yambin media alike in terms of his tactics. Uh, many think he plays defensive football, mm. but at the end of the day, he gets the results. He can tell anybody to shut up because I, I won the game. I played yeah. against Algeria, I drew, I won against Morocco in a friendly. Sure. I played, you know, bigger nations and get often get results. So that tactical formation, we've seen it a little bit change. Mm. Maybe mm. just because this is a friendly also, we've seen some at least a little bit of attacking and position of football. That's right, because when you have good, skillful attacking players, utilize them. <laughs> and that's where the Gambian public, all of us who like football, we all think we're a coach and we all think we know what tactics he should be employing. Um, but uh, I've, whenever I've seen and heard the criticism and I've watched the match, I've always called it cautious rather than defensive, um, because he knows that if you play too expansively, there are teams that can pick you apart. He and once end told up me yeah. in an interview, he said, I don't play defensive football, I play organized attacking football. <laughs> well, well that's, that's what he calls it. <laughs> Obviously, many of us would see, because Gambia sits deep, even against yeah. Angola, the yeah. last match that we sure. won, Angola played lots of possession in yeah. midfield, you know, exchanging beautiful passes. But you know, he had the advantage at some point and SNC scored and that's, that's right. you know, confirmed a place in, in, in the AFCON. But you're right. I mean, sometimes when you sit deep or you're always um, leaving the initiative to the opponent, it can be dangerous because, yes, you might be able to defend. But as, as I said earlier, the fact that you've got good attacking players and good attack-minded players, that's your strength. Use your strength. And I think that's where the public tends to, yes, he's... he's qualified so one is he's, he's made the team qualify for it's made in AFCON so it's hard to criticize him but the danger um, I see is that you know they go there and they think okay we're just grateful to be here let's just try and make sure we're not disgraced the thing is we might not get another generation of players as good as this slot that have qualified so now that you have them use them to their strengths you know but you know as I said I don't think it's particularly defensive I think it's it's I know it's kind of splitting hairs. He might be cautious or over-cautious. And I think that's what kind of drives everything. He wants them to be organized. He wants them to be disciplined. And I think it's part of that discipline means when you get the ball, don't go storming through. But on the other hand, when the opponent have it, you know, close them down, close them down quickly, and then counter-attack. But if you just leave them to have possession, 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 there's going to come a time when they're going to score two, three against you. You won't always be able to keep them out. So use your strengths, your attack-minded players. There have been also another criticism about not being inviting certain players. One of them is Ali So, who plays for a team in the Russian league. Yeah, yeah. He was playing for CSK Moscow in the Big team. Um, so Sofia, that is in Bul the Bulgarian Bulgaria. league. And one yeah. time they were playing Europa League. The coach says, I bring in players in my team who fits my formation, who plays to my tactics. And as well, Ali Show was giving a chance in, in two of the matches that I was the Scorpions coach and he didn't mm. perform well. Yeah. That's his argument. But if that particular player is in form, why not you invite the player? This is it. You might have brought them in when they were not in form or they had a bad game. And so what you can do is that you bring them in for friendlies um, <laughs> and test them, but also in the camp before the friendly, you can actually see them in the practice games that the players play amongst themselves. Then make that decision, well, somebody who's playing at that level, well, we're not Brazil, where Brazil has literally 
players from spread across the world that they can choose from. You know, Brazil can f fill a first and second eleven, none of whom actually play in Brazil. You and I know that, and and they've done so many times. Um, and they have players playing across Gambia. We are not like that. And when we have players who are playing at a high or really decent level, we should be trying to bring them into the squad and see if we can get them to fit in with the with with, with the, the the structure. Yeah. We're looking forward to uh, the Gambia's maiden appearance in the Afcon, of course, and all the uh, discussions that we had about the big controversy in African yeah. football of Benin, Sierra Leone. <laughs> By the time we come to Q Sports uh, next week. Hopefully, we would see a decent game and maybe the deserved winners end up getting that final qualification ticket. That is 23 teams have already confirmed their qualification and one more. And it is the hype to be Benin or Sierra Leone. And we are looking forward to that. On that note, we say thank you very much for watching this broadcast. Have a fantastic evening. Bye.